afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this cold, wet day. Um, I'm very, very well, uh, pleased to welcome today and to introduce to you Dr. Samia Altaf, who is a public health physician and author of um, So Much Aid, So Little Development, of Stories from Pakistan, which is uh, published by the Johns Hopkins uh, University Press. Dr. Altaf graduated from the Fatima Jinnah Medical College in Lahore, Pakistan, and in the University of uh, California at Berkeley, and completed her public health residency training through the California Department of Health. So welcome back, Dr. Altaf. Thank you. In Pakistan, Dr. Altaf worked for UNICEF and USAID, and consulted for the government of Pakistan, for WHO, and a number of bilateral donors. She was a faculty member at the Aga Khan University Medical College in Karachi, um, where she helped establish the Department of Community Medicine in collaboration with McGill and Harvard. Dr. Altaf was the 2007-2008 Pakistan Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars at Washington, D.C. And at present, she is, with, she is the Senior Deputy Director um, at the District of Columbia um, Department of Health. So um, there will be a brief reception following the talk and copies of her book, um, So Much Aid, So Little Development Stories from Pakistan are on sale. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Altaf to hear about the book. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really um, a very nostalgic trip for me to come back to uh, Berkeley. And I want to thank everybody who's made it happen, the Center for South Asian Studies, the Citizens Foundation of Pakistan, and the Pakistan American Cultural Center, who have been very warm and, and caring hosts. Uh, so I will take um, about uh, 30, 40 minutes to uh, just talk about uh, what I have to say and then open up for questions. I, uh, <coughs> so th I, this is basically just a, a come here to talk to you about the issues that are so important to us uh, uh, right now. Um, so the, the uh, title of my talk is the Why Donor Assistance Does Not Work in Countries Like Pakistan. Um, I uh, have a, the, the book basically is a case study of one uh, donor supported program in Pakistan which is called the Social Action Program. This was an $8 billion program, out of which about half a, half a, uh, 450,000, 450 million was a, a, a World Bank loan, and the rest of it was Government of Pakistan funding. That program basically was designed and implemented in Pakistan for 10 years. So the book is the very detailed uh, description of what happened in the design of that program. I was involved, involved with that. But uh, basically, I use that to make a case that that is a generic problem in all the donor-supported programs in developing countries. So the failure of donor assistance to improve social services in developing countries is an important issue at this moment. Most analyses have ignored the larger contextual issues. So I describe that context in my book on Pakistan. Uh, in this story, the so much aid, so little development, because this is a story, and <coughs> as you all know, when things get very complicated, we tell stories to mm -hmm. try and make sense of what's going on. Uh, so in this, in this story, I take you through what I call the rabbit hole to enter a world which is the aid world. So it's a world which is the aid world, and though it is not on any map, it is still a very real world and a very tangible world. And it is also a very large world. It extends from you know, Africa, South Asia, and, and uh, around the globe. So to me, that world seemed very irrational. But just as in Wonderland, to the denizens of aid land or the aid world, it is their rational world. So all the rules over there make perfect sense because they were in the best interest and they continue to be in the best interest of the citizens of that world. So they insist on perpetuating those rules and they insist on living and working by those rules. If you, if you get a chance to read the book, you will find that even the real life characters of aid land have an uncanny resemblance to those in Wonderland. There were the mad hatters with their interminable tea parties. There was the despotic 
uh, Red Queen, who insisted that if I don't play the game as she dictated, with the tools that she wanted me to play with, she would be off with my head. And like the dodo, everyone felt entitled to a prize, even when they did not win. So everybody wanted to go on these junkets all over the place. There were those, again, who, like the queen, wanted recommendations first, analysis afterwards. Mm. And I, too, like Alice say, stuff and nonsense, and insisted that this does not make sense. Even Lucy Mame Sahab, the lead character in this book, those seduced by this aid land in the end, had started out saying that this does not make sense. So this is the world that I describe. And uh, in the book, I use the, the um, uh, I guess, in a sense, it turned out to be a device or foil of Lucy Mame Sahab as, the, as this person who's the external consultant who comes in and, uh, and is my partner in this uh, period while we are uh, putting this program together. And through the, through the progress, through her progress, I try to show how she morphs into, into uh, how the environment and the aid land morphs her from being a rational person to becoming a citizen of the, of the aid land, which is really what happens to a lot of people who get involved in the aid business. Um, let me stop here a little bit and, and uh, let you hear through the mouths of these people who, what, uh, what, uh, what I mean. So this is a senior policy maker who is in charge, a very senior official in the government setup, who is in charge of the uh, putting this whole proposal together, which is a multi-million dollar proposal. And uh, they have to submit it to the aid consortium. And so this is what he says. So when I, when, when, as happens, when consultants are brought in, they are brought in to uh, meet with the, with the senior government team in terms of getting a sense of what is it that they want. So we go to his office and I describe, you know, how the, the, we are asked to wait and there are World Bank people sitting around. And when we get invited to meet the chief, a man with balding head, short neck and weighty jowls, made heavier by his high position, we have only five minutes to ask any specific questions before the chief goes back to his meeting with the World Bank. So do you have any questions? The chief asked, looking encouragingly and automatically at Lucy Mame Saab, who is this Canadian woman. Uh, she and I are the two consultants on this. So he is looking at her, okay, uh, that do you have any questions? But Lucy Mame Saab is new to the country. This is the first time she's come to Pakistan. So she is, you know, kind of, kind of out of it. So she tells me, oh, you are the team leader. So this is the beginning of when you, Lucy Mame Saab and I uh, uh, um, get, encounter each other. And you will see at the last chapter how she just dumps me un <laughs> unceremoniously <laughs> when she morphs into, into uh, something different. So you are the team leader. You ask the questions. So you know, I feel very panicked that we have only five minutes, and I have to ask these, all these questions because there is this huge, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, transformative project that is going to happen in Pakistan. So I turn to the chief, and I want to know of the government's and his vision and his expectations for the, for this project. I want to know the ex extent of ex extent of assistance that we can expect from his office. There's a certain desperation in my voice. I feel it's, if I don't do this, quite, I'm not doing this quite right. How can you discuss in five minutes issues that have been neglected for five decades? So the chief lets me blabber on and then tells us with very portentous gravity about the national importance of SAP, about this wonderful opportunity for finally all of us to pull up our social sectors and about the importance of women in our society. So when I push him and ask more, what exactly importance of women means? How do we translate this into, into specific activities and specific pro programs? The chief looks at me and he says, yes, yes, all that is very well what you say. The federal SAP advisor says, waving an impatient hand. We need the recommendations first for the consortium meets in April and the project has to be ready. So that is the... the uh, uh, senior policy maker. Uh, then uh, there is uh, the, um, so we go through this process of meeting with people from different institutions that are very critical to developing this, this uh, uh, putting together this program which is geared towards 
social services for disadvantaged women and children. And the, the providers of those services are also going to be women because you know there's an opportunity to train women and to uh, bring them, uh, uh, give them opportunities for development. And so we go and meet with this uh, woman who's the director of the Pakistan Nursing Council. And Pakistan Nursing Council is really a very important institution because that is one organization that basically certifies and registers <coughs> all health-related staff. So we go to meet with her and uh, ask her about you know, how they are going to uh, 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 contribute to this, what is her vision, what does she want to see do, here is this opportunity for her to do it. And she also, you know, that also turns out to be a, a, a very strange encounter. And we are wined and dined, and we have tea brought in, and uh, uh, um, <coughs> she talks to us. And we raise this issue that, uh, uh, you know, what is it that the international agencies can do to make sure that uh, women get trained as nurses and they are able to find fulfilling and and useful employment within the government system which actually supports the government's effort to provide these services and so we have this conversation with with uh, her in which she I, I've titled it over here as calling it the vanishing nurses and we, we uh, talked to her about it and she says that uh, the issue is that why do the nurses get trained and leave the country because then this is a loss to the donors and and uh, uh, also to the government. So you say, you have mentioned that nurses leave the country at the first opportunity. Is that a major problem? Oh yes, it is a terrible loss. Our own country desperately needs the manpower, but what can we do? Well, all governments can stop qualified people for leaving the country. There are bonds and there are uh, 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 other ways to do it. Uh, but uh, but uh, the director says all government servants who wish to leave the country need to obtain a no objection certificate and then they can go. But you can stop them from going, we say. But why do it, says Mrs. S. As it is, there are not enough jobs in the country to absorb all the qualified nurses. They go, for they too have families to take care of. They work for some years on short-term contracts, and after they have made enough money to build a house, to educate a brother, or collect a dowry for themselves or for a daughter, then they come back. And then Mrs. S adds, after a brief pause, in fact, it is better for us to let them go. Otherwise, they will create trouble for us. And this is a consistent theme that we hear all the time. And I put that actually in the book. The, uh, the chief of planning and development, the, uh, the director of the, of the largest uh, uh, district health system in, in the largest province of Punjab, they actually use exactly the same word, that they will create trouble for us, or they will be a headache for us. So why is it that trained people and qualified people, especially trained and qualified women, are going to be a trouble or a headache for the government of Pakistan? And they, in a sense, encourage them to leave the country. You know, why, why bother to, to enforce a bond? Why bother to do this? Uh, I am also going to read just a little bit of a portion uh, from uh, um, what I call the Regional Training Institute, which is also an institute developed by donor money, a set of institutes development, developed in Pakistan by donor money over the past 25 years. The pur purpose of those institutes actually is to again train and produce a cadre of mid-level female workers who are called family welfare workers. And this happened under the impetus of, of developing a contraceptive delivery program, that this should be a vertical program, there should be dedicated female workers who just uh, filter uh, family planning and contraceptive services. So these special institutes <coughs> were developed where these women are trained and they are then certified by the nursing council. And so this lady that we talked to is, is a woman who is um, uh, a very, again a very senior government bureaucrat and has been running these institutes for the past so many years, is very well respected, is very influential. We saw that she could pick up the phone and call Islamabad and get things done very quickly. So we talked to her about the same issues. So when we are when we meet her and we are talking to her, she says this about uh, the issue of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> women who remain behind the country in in the country are. Lucy Memsaf says that you know if you don't stop people from going, then what you have left is is a problem <coughs> of poorer quality. 
So this upsets Mrs. R very much. So she says here, my dear madam, there is thunder in Dr. R's voice. She's a doctor. Let me tell you that no one from our institution is of poor quality. We produced first rate material. Our girls can do the most difficult delivery better than any of your obstetricians. <clears throat> and they do this using only the knowledge that we taught her and the two hands that God has given her. And then she tells us about how one of her girls had success successfully delivered a baby with two hands, with a baby with two heads using just her two hands. And I, at that time, had that image of this woman delivering one baby with one, one head with one hand and the other head with the other. So she says this is her, her uh, stance and attitude about women. This is what she thinks. But when we bring her down to the specifics of doing something that the women have an incentive to stay, they can, they can use their skills effectively and continue to work in the country and stay there. You know, this is what she says. Uh, she says to us that, uh, you know, you should, we, we tell her that, okay, so she says this, you know, uh, why stop them? As it is, it is better to let them go, okay? They can be benefit to themselves and they can be benefit to the country because then they send back a lot of foreign exchange. So on the one hand, you know, she is very thunderous about not having poor quality and women are how important. And there's another whole paragraph I dedicate to her. She makes a big speech because her mother or her aunt was part of the Qaeda Azams, the, the um, um, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah who led this movement for separation of Pakistan, how one of her female relatives was part of his inner circle and how they fought, neglected their home and their husbands and their children and they fought. So the women fought hand in hand with men to bring this about. So how important women are. And then when we push her that, you know, her government should do something about making sure that these very qualified women and women who are very much needed and who are needed to fight for hand in uh, shoulder to shoulder with men should be asked to stay. And she says, why? Let them go. Okay. It is good for them. Otherwise, they create problems for us. It is a headache for us. And then she tells us over lunch that she is going to her upcoming trip. She tells us about her upcoming trip trip to United States to the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University for a curriculum design workshop, which is organized by the Center for Development of Population Activities. It is one of the contractors here in Washington, D.C., which is funded by uh, U.S. government, organized by the Center for Development and Population Activities and funded by USAID. This is her third visit for curriculum development workshop, which is a workshop held every year from which uh, and uh, people from developing countries are brought to that. What will she do there, we ask her. Oh, nothing much, she replies airily. There is nothing these people can teach her, given her experience. And with a my dears, let me tell you, she launches into a long and glowing tale of the kind of experiences she has had in curriculum design for the past 20, 25 years. Then why are you going, Lucy Mem Saab asks innocently. Since you know everything about curriculum design, as you should, surely there are other staff members less experienced than you who can benefit, and so benefit the institution. Yes, that is true, but this might be her last chance. She retires soon, and USA AID is pulling out of the country. This was in the early 90s when under the Pressler Amendment, uh, USAID, US government, uh, was not uh, uh, funding um, development assistance in Pakistan. Uh, so USAID is pulling out of the country, this stupid business of the bomb. She has a son in graduate school in Boston, and his graduation coincides with the dates of the workshop. And why the hell not, she says with a challenging shake of her head. She is, after all, the principal and has done so much for this RTI. We should have seen it before. There were no supplies, no furniture, nothing. She could make, she made all this happen just with a phone call. So, you know, there is this there is this uh, uh, attitude that, you know, this is a personal, um, in a sense, personal perks that uh, aid is supposed to, uh, to be providing. Let me also read you a, a piece from Women's Division, uh, which was a division which was set up uh, for, uh, uh, under the planning and development and has now become a ministry by itself. 
and the purpose of this division was to specifically focus again on, on uh, women's uh, development and bring about policies and programs that contribute to women's development. So this also turns out to be really a very bizarre encounter because this uh, person who's director of women's division is clearly not at all interested in, in engaging with us or you know telling us uh, what to do. But I keep pushing him and I keep pushing him and I keep harassing him. So at the end, you know, I ask him that you know surely there is some problem that uh, uh, women in Pakistan have, working women have that you can help solve. You know, you are the women's division. You know, you're, you, you have a voice. You, and, and under this uh, uh, program, you have an opportunity. So he gets up on his way out and he says, uh, so when I say, what are your collaborating strategies? And if you hear the words that these people say, those are just completely meaningless words. They tell you nothing. So he says, of course, says the director with the, uh, uh, there are many collaborating strategies. All government departments are working together, just as the women's division is working with them. Uh, and I asked him, can you cite some common problems that are an impediment to uh, the implementation of programs? The major problem, he gets up nonchalantly uh, and picks up his uh, dark glasses to walk out. The major problem regarding women's development is the problem of parda in women. Unless that is done away with, no progress can be made. That's it. And then he stands up, and now if you will excuse me, I have to get to a meeting at the Secretariat with the Planning and Development Department. I am in fact meeting with a SAP advisor on this very issue. And you see, this is how we collaborate. And he walks out. And then I describe how he takes Lucy Memsa with him and leaves me there, you know, st <laughs> standing in his dust. So I go on and on, and I t again, you know, I won't uh, take up any more time, that there is, there is, uh, um, the director of Punjab, who is also, you know, the they are they are designing while while we are designing this program, which is a social action program, another parallel program funded by the Asian Development Bank is being being devised uh, designed, and so we I find myself in the office of the uh, director of health services province of Punjab, and you know I describe that whole episode, which it's called the chapter is called a day in the life of the Punjab Health Department. So I describe what happens over here, how they design this project. And the director actually comes back and we tell him in one day and half a day that the project has been designed. And he says, so how many vehicles did you put in? Make sure that you have so many hundreds of vehicles. You should have these vans. And, you know, that is all he wants to focus on. So, you know, there is again this issue of, you know, what is it that they are looking for to do in, in, in these kinds of things. So each chapter has, has uh, 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 words like this, which actually, you know, now when I was reading it again, I thought it was very strange that almost similar words came out of the mouths of all of these, uh, all of these uh, very senior people. I will uh, uh, read just a little bit about what I call the morphing of Lucy Mame Sahab from being a regular person to a citizen of the aid land when she had gone through this uh, whole process. Uh, very early on, you know, I, when I see her for the first time, I describe uh, in, a, in a sense, a visual, that then there is Lucy Mame Sahab. I take one look at her struggling with her omelet and I'm seized with a panic that al alternates with exasperation. I have worked long enough with international consultants to know that Lucy Mame Sahab will need a lot of time and energy to be brought to some level of basic understanding of what Pakistan is, what its health system and population sectors are about, and the role of female workers in that sector. I'm not looking forward to this. The first impression she gives is one of gray limpness. Her hair is limp, her hands, which one of which she offers to shake, is limp, and her clothes are limp. Uh, with her neck huddled in, uh, in her, uh, with her neck huddled in her shoulders, she looks completely out of sorts. She has a stomach ache. Her bag has been misplaced by the airline, so she's very anxious. She, this is her first trip to a developing country. If she don't count a holiday trip to Mexico. And she is not sure if she, should, she, should, if she should have brought the chador with her or not. The chador became famous after the Iranian Revolution, as you remember, in 1979, when it, and, and it's a long cloak kind of a thing that is worn by uh, uh, women in many South Asian countries. And then she goes to say, I don't even know why I'm here. Uh, I was told that uh, I, I would find a local consultant, a local technical expert who would be responsible for all the work. Is that you? She asked me and I tell her, yes, I am. She again says, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even know where Pakistan was. I thought it was in India. 
So the weight consultant says, oh, it's okay, you know, don't worry. Uh, while I'm getting upset, you know, the, the, the CEDA consultant says, don't worry. You know, almost all foreigners make this mistake, and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fine, you know, we have to go, we have to go through these motions. And then I come to pay, uh, at the end of the project, if you see Lucy Memsab, Lucy Memsab has morphed into this very stunning, uh, 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 citizen of this uh, aid world, and uh, and she kind of uh, uh, is it? yes. So I see her uh, uh, coming towards me, and I am I am quite uh, stunned. I see Lucy Mamsa weave in and out of the tables as she walks towards me. She is wearing a flowery billowy, billo <laughs> billowy uh, magenta print skirt and an embroidered ivory silk blouse. A flowing dupatta of ivory chiffon, very intricately embroidered, is slung around her neck uh, and it completes the elegant ensemble. Her hair, dyed a vibrant brown, is in a fashionable perm, all fluffed up and around her face. It's very flattering. She wears gold hoop earrings and colorful bangles on her wrists, which tinkle and jangle merrily when she waves, happily acknowledging me. And then when I ask her about the report, because she had to do a portion of the report, she says, oh, about today's report? Don't worry a thing about it, she says. I have the whole thing right here. She taps her bag, which has the diskette. And I have a printed copy. This was that time when diskettes were still being used for those, for those who, are, who are not uh, at, that, uh, at that date. And I have a printed copy sent two days ago to the Federal SAP Advisor's Office. He has seen it already, so the project is approved. So here I am, you know, we had separated. She had gone to Balochistan, I had gone to Punjab, and we were supposed to get together to put our report and recommendations together. And you know, she had done all of this, and it had gone to the SAP uh, Advisor's Office. So she morphs into, uh, and she tells me this, oh, you know, so, so, uh, and after all, it is their project. You know, you and I will be out of here and on with our lives. And then we should let them do what they want to do. It is a government's project, and we should support it. Our, our purpose is that as consultants, we should support them. So that is what happens to Lucy Mensa. I will also just read very quickly, because that is something also that upset me very much about the role uh, of the, so this is what is happening in Pakistan, but the international donor agencies are equally complicit in this. So I describe here the same uh, 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 project which was being described and evaluated in, in World Bank, actually in the main set complex, which I was also part of that uh, meeting. So that I describe that whole meeting in this chapter, which is called Bank's World, which is oil and lizard's tail, because that's what I say, that that's what they do. Um, so this person who is in charge of this portion of this social action program, which is which pertains to the population development uh, activities and the contraceptive pr program and you know the reproductive health program, describes the whole program of what we are doing and what strategy is. So he describes a strategy which is called the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, it's, it's a new program. It, it's new and improved, and it's likely to work. And you know, women are involved. At that time, uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto had overtaken uh, the, as the overtaken <laughs> was the, the prime minister after Nawaz Sharif's government was uh, was uh, uh, you know kind of uh, pushed over um, under corruption charges. So both Nawaz Sharif and uh, Benazir Bhutto saw, oversaw this. And when ben is, and this this meeting was being held when Benazir was the prime minister, so there was this big thing that now that the prime minister is a woman, you know, just see how well well this thing gets done. So there's a huge hoopla about this being a very new program. So what is the new program proposed and funded by the World Bank's experts and adopted so eagerly by the government of Pakistan? It is called the area-based approach to contraceptive delivery. That is, contraceptives will be distributed to a whole area all at once. Jim, who is describing this, looks very triumphant <coughs> as he announces this. And it sounds to me like an airdrop in response to some great emergency. I imagine it raining condoms and intrauterine devices and pills in Chenesar Boat and Kamuki and Mitti and in Gujramala and in Sialpur. Maybe even the bank's audience that up till now, you know, along all of his description had been going along with him, looks a little skeptical over there, uh, looks a little skeptical. And Jim, who looks like Beethoven in the three of creation, cries, hey, we are doing the best we can. Honestly speaking, we do not know much about this issue. We are learning as we go along. 
And anyway, we shall find out in a couple of years if it is right or wrong. In the meantime, we've got to do something. These are enormous problems. And so people are satisfied. But this is exactly where I become very dissatisfied. And I say that, you know, uh, you know, how can you just say something like that and ex expect to be taken seriously? And then I go on to say that, you know, you call yourself an expert. You go halfway around the world at enormous financial cost to the country. Uh, all the cost, and you know, all the cost of technical input, the travel, the hotel, and all of that <coughs> is part of that loan or the grant that the developing country gets. And that has to become, that has to be returned in, in whatever fashion. Okay. And you know that, you, you yourself know that you are learning as you go along. I mean, come on. And you expect your advice to be taken seriously. You know that it will be taken seriously because you have the power to say that this is what we will do. This is what we will fund. You convince the government to spend this huge amount of money, which will be a burden for next three generations. And then you sit before a gathering of your peers and you say that you do not know what you are doing and you are, you, you are learning as you go along. And then what I say is that what is very interesting is that suppose, why is it that this kind of uh, uh, attitude happens in this development sector, in the social sector? Suppose you were an expert. So when you are designing social programs for developing countries, this kind of an attitude is fine. And then I say, suppose you were an expert in designing carburetors instead of population welfare programs. You go to Ford Motor Company and say, yes, me and my team of people here will design your carburetors for the next model. We will be honest. We don't know much. We will <laughs> learn as we go along. And we, you will find out in two or three years whether the carburetor works or it doesn't. You can imagine Mr. Ford's <laughs> response. But this is hypothetical because you yourself know that this is so bizarre, you won't do this. But as a citizen and denizen of the aid world, you know, this makes perfect sense. And then, you know, since I'm a physician, I can't resist bringing in a clinical analogy. And I say, you know, suppose you had prostate cancer, okay? And you go to a, to a surgeon and he says, yes, fine, I will remove your prostate. I don't know what I'm doing, I'll learn as I go along and you'll find out <laughs> whether it works or it doesn't. I mean, come on. You know, so, so I, you know, I get very upset. <coughs> so this is, this is, these are basically what the real life stories are. So this, I'm describing the, the uh, um, aid land or the world, world of aid. But, you know, on a more serious note and, uh, and really in some sense a very sad commentary on all of us is that if you look behind all the stuff and nonsense, you find an explanation for the aid failure, which is neither innocent nor arbitrary. For behind this seeming absurdity lies very clear and serious logic. Okay? So what I have determined is that the underlying systemic problem, why this happens and why donor-supported programs fail, is an inappropriate program design. This design that is out of context of local implementation realities is based on skewed incentives and mutually rewarding interdependent alignments between the program planners, the program managers, the implementers, the NGOs, and the contractors. So this existing model of aid is a flawed model. It is not likely to produce the results that we expect it to produce. So with this situation, uh, since we, I want to leave time for questions and answers, I just put out five things that I call are important issues to consider. First is that the inter it seems that international donor community knows very little about developing countries. We see aid work in Afghanistan now unraveling so rapidly in spite of huge amount of technical expertise and you know um, everybody putting their heads together and thinking about what needs to be done and very serious about doing it. It's just unraveling so rapidly. Donors invest huge sums of money in programs in, in Africa and Asia, such as population welfare programs, and they do not try to find out why people in developing countries have large families. Water and sanitation programs are developed without consideration to local terrain and local power relations. It's the same water and sanitation program that is developed in Punjab in Pakistan and the same in sub-Saharan African countries. It's the same program although you know they are completely different countries. 
they have seen, the donors actually see everyday activities that are hijacked by, by vested interests, yet they look the other way. Representatives of donors such as World Bank and USAID and DFID who have spent you know, close to decades in countries uh, like Pakistan or, or Nigeria or, or uh, 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 other developing countries, they're traveling first class, staying in air conditioned comfort of five star hotels, meeting and speaking with local elites similar to themselves. They only know and also help create a version of the country that suits them. Mostly from US or Western Europe, their assessments of the problems in developing countries is with reference to their own realities and limited to their own perspectives of their own country. They do not consider the possibility that the civil society in a country such as Pakistan may not conform to the norms and practices of their own civil societies. Unequal status of the stakeholders. You know, stakeholders meetings have become a big thing of, of the development agencies. Unequal status of the stakeholders, even just the ability to speak English, can easily shape the outcome of stakeholder meetings. So there is a clear mismatch between the policies and realities on the ground. And at the same time, their experts' perceptions and their power creates an altered reality. You see how Lucy names up changes and the decision then she then makes and how she changes the environment that she comes in. If you read the book, you will see that. The number two notion that I think is important for us also to get take into consideration is that this is not entirely this issue that is important. The average citizen in developing countries and those in developed countries are equally complicit. The first, the citizen of the developing country do not have a voice or a place at the table and so they know very little about what is happening and being done for them and in their name by the donors. You know, I'm very familiar with Pakistan and it is very interesting that MDGs is a big thing now in this new development uh, round. You know, you step outside of the uh, perimeter half a mile from the center of Islamabad and nobody has even heard of what the MDG is and what it means. The second uh, 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 person, the, the citizen in developed countries is also equally complicit. For example, I know that US citizens expect their regulatory agencies, US citizens fund basically the development program, it's their tax dollars. So they expect their regulatory agencies, such as the government accounting office, to see that their tax dollar is used as intended. These regulators monitor utilization of funds through reports that are submitted by donors themselves. So GAO asks USAID for how they spent the money. Okay? There is no review of effectiveness or appropriateness. So there is only a review of utilization. Okay? So if 100 million were expected to be utilized <coughs> in, uh, uh, in uh, reproductive health, GAO, GAO, the Government Accounting Office, makes sure that it went to a program which was in reproductive health. What it did, whether that program was appropriate or it was designed well or implemented well or whatever, is not their concern. And any ge genuine third party evaluations are extremely rare. The third party evaluation reports that you see that have been done on donor supported programs are usually supported by the same donors. So, you know. The third notion that is important to keep in mind is that donor assistance in developing countries is planned and managed through a very rigidly managed and rigidly structured script. In that script, there are skewed incentives for program managers. So this script basically involves six group of actors. Four <coughs> actors are the visible ones and two are the invisible ones. The visible actors, if you see now, if you look at wh what's happening, is that the donor agency, their international contractors, their local subcontractors or the NGOs, and the local government. So once the funding is approved and appropriated and it uh, goes out, the, the donor agency brings in their contractors, the contractors subcontract and uh, hire uh, local NGOs, and there's a, then there's the uh, national government of the developing country. So these are the four, what I call the four visible actors. 
and the two invisible ones again. So these are the four actors that are on stage, and you see the relationship and and the alignments that they have, how they work together. You know, they, they uh, help each other. The two invisible ones who I see off the stage in the wings is the is the uh, citizen of the developed country who is interested in making sure that their money does what it is supposed to do, and the citizens of the developing country who doesn't have a voice. So the relationship amongst the visible four is finely aligned and works very smoothly. This is what happens. Donors disperse funds. The national government is happy to receive the money. Contractors, mostly for-profit businesses, implement the activities, and NGOs find a source of revenue in this partnership in most of the developing countries where sources of revenue are very limited. The incentives of these four are aligned in keeping this aid cycle moving and spending the money. That is how they all stand to gain. As long as the money goes from one stage <coughs> to the next to the next and then is spent. Usually there are no consequences for how funds are spent, but there are very serious consequences if the money is not spent in the assigned time period. The incentives and relationships for these four actors are configured in such a manner that no single actor can suggest a change in the script even if they know that the program is not working. Given this incestuous relationship, ineffective program designs are perpetuated. If you look at the history of SAP, which was implemented for 10 years, you know, it was very clear early on that it's not working. You know, very, very knowledgeable people, for example, Shahid Kardar, who just quit as the, uh, or resigned as the uh, governor state back of Pakistan. I quote him repeatedly in my book because he was at that time part of uh, the ministry or some place where he has said again and again that this is not uh, uh, working. But yet, World Bank continued to fund it, and the government of Pakistan continued to support it. And I've spoken already about the two invisible actors. Uh, <clears throat> so the fourth notion, so this is the third notion that's important. The first notion is that, you know, at a philosophical level, it seems that human beings would understand that it is insane to continue to do the same thing in the same manner and expect different results, right? Yet. This model continues. Even today, the aid money to most of the developing countries through multilateral or bilateral is being programmed in exactly the same fashion. And yet people expect different results. So why does this model continue? So I described that also a little bit in an earlier uh, uh, introduction to the book that in my view why it continues. It seems that it continues because it is not designed to work for the average citizen and they have no power to influence it in a different direction. It, it looks like from, from, from the analysis and from the description that it is designed to work for important people, for those in power, and for its own industry, the aid industry. And why would they have an interest in changing it? So whatever financial uh, benefits the industry gets, why should it do something different to change those? And since no one entity can stop it on its own, it continues. It's like the game. Once the music starts, everybody starts dancing. And they continue to dance till the money has been dispersed. So every year, the development funds have to be dispersed in a short period of time. The consequences for not spending the money are very serious. Those of us and those of you who have been in the aid business, you, you are very familiar with terms like bulging pipelines, slow burn rates that spell doom for program managers. People have lost their jobs or gained very high positions because they've been able to do one or the other. We are so practiced at the mad rush to empty the pipeline before the end of the fiscal year. You know, those of you who are in the aid business know that, you know, there's a desperation to empty the pipeline. The local partners, which is the national governments in developing countries, are usually unrepresentative of their population. They are sitting on shaky resource bases and are happy to receive whatever money they can in their kitty. So they let this, this uh, go on. So what should be done in the future to make things work for the citizens of Pakistan? First, like Alice, I say that we should continue to ask questions. And we should continue to say, this does not make sense. Mm. Okay. And then, uh, in, in, the, in, in uh, really speaking, that there needs to be a fundamental change in the program design, and not the current tinkering at the margins that is being proposed, for example, in a country like Pakistan. You know, 
uh, USAID says, well, fine, if the contractors are, are, are skimming off, you know, 30% or 50%, we will not hire international contractors, but we will hire local contractors. Okay? But it's exactly the same thing. It's very interesting. USAID is just now funding a program which is, in, uh, is called the Gender Equity Program, in which they have done exactly this. They have made a local entity, the Oric Foundation, the prime contractor. The Oric <coughs> Foundation is a local entity. But the subprime, the major subprime, is the, uh, again an international contractor. And why would an international contractor work for not the same amount of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, benefits and the same amount of uh, profits? Okay. And you know, people who who criticize the contractors, especially international contractors, I say that why why should they be criticized? You know, they are not doing anything illegal. This is how the business is set up. That, that's how contractors work. You expect a car salesman to make a profit. You expect a physician to make a profit. Why would you not expect a development contractor to make a profit? So that is, again, not the issue. The issue is that it's the way this relationship is aligned and the way the program is designed that the contractors end up doing, doing what they do. I won't uh, go into the uh, details of what uh, we recommend as change. But I'm saying that the, the, the one, we should ask questions. And the second thing is that this habit um, of the donor agencies and the multilateral agencies developing the country's sector strategies need to stop. Countries should develop their own sector development visions and not allow the donors to define what should be done and how. Because most of the developing countries don't do that. You know, the, the representatives of the, of the uh, you know the political representatives don't uh, you know are not either technically qualified or whatever they don't develop their own sector strategies because or if they have to develop their sector strategies they have to actually put in uh, uh, processes that make sure that they are implementable at the at the provincial or at the district level and you know they have no interest in doing that so that needs to be done in the long run the donor assistance model needs to change I have, and some of us also who've been working in the development sector, we've written extensively and in great detail about what needs to be done in the education sector and in the health sector uh, specifically, and also in generally in development uh, in many other places. Uh, one of the places that we put most of our, our work is uh, a blog, which is called The South Asian Idea. It's www.thesouthasianidea.com. And most of our uh, recommendations we have published in the popular press and also in uh, or put on uh, placed on that blog. So I will I will stop here so that we have time for a little bit of comments and and discussions. Thank you very much. For scathing indictment really of the process uh, both from the point of view of sort of what's happening inside the country as well as um, what's happening in the back um, and, and, and and your solution seems out of keeping with the enormity of the problem that is you say that the program design has to change but listening to your story I'm thinking why should it change? I don't understand why anybody would have an interest in it changing if indeed the, the idea of aid, right? What is the idea of international aid about? You either believe it's, it reflects a certain geopolitical strategy or you believe it, it, it reflects benevolence. I think we know it doesn't really reflect benevolence. So if it actually reflects geopolitical strategy, then this is just fine. Why? <coughs> See, it's, it's actually very pertinent and very, very uh, good comment. Uh, on this blog, we, there is, a, there is a, a series of articles that we actually define what is foreign, air, foreign assistance, what is donor assistance, what are the different pieces of it, what is the purpose of it. So yes, if it is geopolitical strategy, then maybe it's working fine. But but I say to you that in Pakistan, this strategy has not won, won over any hearts and minds. Yeah. So even as so a even geopolitical, terms, <laughs> yeah. So even in geopolitical strategy terms, it's not working. 
And this recent uh, debate around the Kerry Luger funding, uh, you know, Wilson Pro uh, Center uh, has uh, put out a report which is called Aid Without Abetting. I was part of that working group. This was actually the issue that, uh, um, you know, what is the purpose of aid? And there are, there are those uh, who say that, you know, this is such a small portion of the, of the GNP, it's such a small amount, you know, it creates, it creates so many problems, why even worry about this? But there are some of us who argue that, you know, uh, for countries that are uh, um, like Pakistan and other, other countries of, which are at the same level of uh, development and have the same kind of political structure, you know, this can really be a very good leverage for, for the international community to push the government and to push the representatives to basically um, it use it as a leverage to drive the minimal reforms. For example, most of the people say that even given this model, if the governance issues in Pakistan or in India or in other countries were, were sorted out, this would be a lot more effective than it is now. So it can be, it can be a leverage to drive the minimal reforms that would then determine the eligibility of that country to get more loan and all of that. I think it, is a good, it, it can be used as a leverage to push because you know the, most of the representatives that these countries have really are not representative of their people. So it does, it does look like that they are not working in the interest of their people. So what leverage does international community have to be able to do that? So. And in that, in that series of detailed articles, we do describe how even within this, within this again, uh, uh, same structure, how there are very crucial small nodal points that can be changed and recalibrated mm -hmm. to make this effective. And I say that in detail at that uh, even USAID has the ability to do that even now. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned that the GAO only have measures for like how the funds are appropriated. They don't do reports on like how effective the programs are. It seems like a lot of the issues could be solved if they just measured, if the donor programs they measured more so on the, um, the effectiveness of the programs. Why is that the setup? Why is it set up right now so the GAO does not measure the effectiveness of the programs so they only appropriate funds? Is It seems like that it, naturally people would want to see, are these programs effective and are are we getting, like the taxpayers would want to know, are we getting what we're, is our money being put towards good use? Yeah. You know, it is, it is really um, uh, the way U.S. government assistance works and the way it is, it is uh, monitored and the way it is accounted for is, is really quite a complex uh, system. Um, uh, but it is, what, what, what they want to ensure is because most of these funds are earmarked, what they call they are, they are meant for certain purposes. So, so the government's accounting office has to make sure that it has gone towards that purpose. So if it is meant for child survival, it has gone towards activities that were in child survival. If it is meant for uh, energy, it has gone into activities that were there to produce energy. If it was meant for education, it has gone into activities that were uh, 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 implementing education programs. So they ensure that. So that is what we call utilization. It was utilized for the purpose that it was meant. Let me give you an example. You know, during the SAP period, uh, when the World Bank actually reviewed the education component of it, just in the province of Punjab alone, there were 50,000 ghost schools. Okay. What that means, they use the word term ghost schools. What that means is that there are schools on paper. So there is a school, there is a teacher, there are a number of students, and so there is somebody is taking the salaries, you know, there is all. So that money, so that money was utilized for the purpose that it was meant. It was meant for education. So how effective it was, that is left basically to the donor agency. You know, USAID has a very elaborate pro uh, 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 program of what they call the results framework and monitoring and, you know, third party assessment and, uh, and their partners monitor themselves and their partners produce evaluation reports. But the funding is always from the parent agency. So how can, how can you be, how can you, how can that be an evaluation be a genuine evaluation? So I quite agree with you, you know, elsewhere I do say 
that there's a that uh, basically U.S. government and Congress needs to be much more proactive. And I am I would say that you know that uh, I I use that example that you remember when the um, mission to moon one of the missions crashed. And it was found that there was these tiles or something that expanded or didn't expand. If you read the what happened, how the government responded, so it was what you know, how many billion, ten billion or twenty billion dollars that was you know kind of. So the U.S. the response of U.S. government was very interesting. It so set up a commission to review that crash of ten or twenty billion, and uh, uh, the commission reviewed what happened and how it happened, and then they found out uh, that. Uh, these tiles were loose, and they were loose or whatever. And it was a, a decision. The turning point was a decision between the politicians and the technical people. So the political decisions, in a sense, were the were the paramount decisions, which moved that that it should fly at the time. That so what I say is that that is exactly what Congress and GOA and the U.S. government should do in terms of USAID funded programs in developing countries. Just in Pakistan, you know, over the past 20 years, how many billions of dollars have gone into into development uh, donor assistance? And if we say that those programs have failed, it is really a crash of that magnitude. Okay, that needs to be investigated and that needs to be reviewed. It's like, you know, there's this huge crash year after year, year after year, and nobody looks into the black box to say what was the reason for that yeah. crash. So who is the most appropriate entity to do it? Okay. Who is the most appropriate? I'd say that it is the US government, it's the Congress. You know, they have that ability to say that, you know, this is this is what needs to be done because it is the US taxpayers' money. Right? So I quite agree with you that that responsibility, that needs to be looked at. So that's part of the recommendations that we make wherever we write. That there needs to be many more pieces. When I talk about program design, I just say that, you know, there is this this small window of opportunity, while these, this money has been appropriated and has been moved to, to the donor agencies, World Bank or Asian Development Bank, and it is being disbursed in Pakistan, given that nothing else changes, okay, given that nothing else changes, even if then we change the program design, the design of the program, and, and the incentives are different for people who, who manage the program. You know, the incentives for managers who go through these development programs are just so horrible. They have to uh, spend this money in this period, otherwise, you know, they will lose their job. So who wants to lose their job? So if you, if you say to them that if you don't spend this money and you do it effectively, you won't lose your job. It is then that you get your promotions and your perks, they will start doing that. So it's a, a, we talk about, you know, development programs and program design, but it boils down to men and women, human beings, and their perceptions and their desires and their in some sense, petty interests, you know, because you know this, it's 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 not widgets. It's human beings who make these things happen. So, sorry, sorry, very quickly. Let me just. Uh, I'm not sure. Last, yeah, you had a question. Um, are there any examples of aid programs that have worked that could be used as a model? For instance, I guess Greg Mortensen's. I read about his theory of how to provide aid, but has that worked or? Well, there's enough uh, um, debate to say that that hasn't worked either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I haven't looked at it. I haven't, uh, I'm just reading the literature that is available. And I see evidence from, from the way it was implemented that it went down the same path. You know, if you look at development programs in Pakistan, they start with huge fanfare. You know, there is international contractors come in there, so it's so glitzy, they hire uh, very fancy young men and women, you know, who are very smart and very sharp and speak very good English and use the right jargon. They set up these fancy offices, they bring in these fancy vehicles, you know, four wheel drives and cars and this. We have these fancy meetings in five star hotels and, you know, we create these fancy documents and all of those things. So, you know, if you and if you look at the reports, yes, the first quarter report says success, the second quarter report says success, the first annual report, because the office was set up, we did this, we did so many training workshops, we did that. And, and the favorite thing of most of the development uh, programs is training, because we want to build, build up human capacity. So you train you know, nurses, you train doctors, you train midwives, you train all of these people. But what happens to those training peop uh, uh, trained people? So you build up capacity by training people, but there's no 
parallel capacity of, of the institutional capacity that is built up so that these people can be utilized in those, in those uh, uh, jobs that are required for them. When I was working for USAID, I went and begged and pleaded with, uh, we were supposed to fund, you know, 10 physicians, 10 gov or 20 government officials to go to India or to somewhere, uh, to Norway or to some place to learn about HIV AIDS program management. And I said to the government of Pakistan that I, and since it was my, my, my uh, part of my responsibility to approve that funding, I said I will not approve that funding till the government of Pakistan, the Secretary of Health and the DG Health in Islamabad are able to convince me that at the same time they're making sure that when these people come back after six months of being trained, that their HIV AIDS training program is being started and that these people would be placed in those programs. You know, I dug in my heels, but very soon everybody started beating up on me, including USAID, because I was holding up the pipeline. The uh, Pakistan government was very angry. They went and complained about me that she is not cooperating. The contractors were very angry who were supposed to do this, that, you know, we have uh, asked to get this done. She is holding up our activities, okay? The people who were supposed to go were very angry with me because I was holding up their uh, foreign, or, you know, trip. foreign trip and, and whatever. So everybody beat up on me and, I, and most, most of all my supervisor beat up on me and let me know in no uncertain terms that I'm not supposed to hold up the pipeline. Okay? But you know, I followed up what happened to these people. So they went, they came, they got HIV AIDS training, they were mid-level to senior level government officials who were supposed to come back in the Ministry of Health. Some of them were physicians, some of them were not. They were supposed to come back and manage the uh, health programs. You know, 90% of them got posted out to agriculture department or to, you know, labor. Yes, because they are bureaucrats. That's how, that's how it functions. Every two years they get they get uh, posted out, and why not? Why should somebody who's gone for six months AIDS training to Sweden come back and insist, no, I'm going to stay with the Department of Health? No. Part of their, their career path is that that's what will happen. So that is an issue in the, in the governance that comes in, that you know, uh, how does the government, uh, uh, Ministry of Health, governs and administers its, its, its uh, programs? What kind of changes does it want to bring or can bring? So these are very small, micro-level, uh, examples, but you know, I maintain that it is the details that make or break uh, uh, the program. So, devil really is in the details, and that's what I've tried to show. That you know, the small details, basically, which seems meaningless, and you know, we we uh, are not, we don't think too much about you know, moving one degree here and there, but you know, that uh, that matters. So, you know, in terms of uh, to answer your question, successful programs, I do not see any successful programs in Pakistan. One program that people all talk about and write about is the Orangi Pilot Project, which is the sanitation program in large squatter population in Karachi, called Orangi. And you know, it is a community, and it is basically uh, has not been it, uh, it's uh, it's not been funded by donors. It's been funded completely by the community. And it took a, it took 20 years, not one one funding cycle. It took 20 years to come to some steady state level where it can work. But most of the donor-supported programs, uh, unless there are there are programs which are really emergency relief and 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 uh, <coughs> for a specific purpose, like donors do very well in flood relief. You know, they can bring together, you know, so many packets of food and drop them. You know, in in the in the earthquake, 2005 earthquake. You know, most of the donors did very well. You know, U.S. government did very well. Overnight and within 24 hours, they were able to set up field hospitals because they didn't have to work about worry at all about uh, you know um, working with the government of Pakistan. Or they brought in their own own equipment, their own supplies, their own tents, their own everything, and just set up field ho hospitals overnight. What happened to those field ho hospitals after that funding left is another story. But you know, but programs which need to be built into the fabric of that society, okay. Somehow people don't understand that that fabric is completely uh, tattered and torn and decayed fabric. So unless we do something to make sure that these glitzy programs are not so heavy that they just uh, sink. You know, I, being a clinician, I always give this example that, you know, a plastic surgeon will not put in a graft unless that graft bed is cleaned up 
It has enough blood supply and it is clear of infection. <coughs> what we are doing in donor programs is that we are not cleaning up the graft bed and we are just applying these, these things. So obviously the graft gets rejected. So we should not be surprised that it gets rejected. I don't think that it's a question of law. You know, nothing. there's nothing illegal that's going on. See, this whole process is not an illegal process. This is the way that this business is set up. You know, uh, people, uh, and most of the international contractors who I know are also very unhappy with me, but I defend them. I feel that they are not doing anything illegal. Okay, that is what their business is. They sell a product. They are expected to make a profit. And uh, most of the contractors actually sell a very good product. It's just that when we go, we might go out to buy a product which is not applicable over here. We need to know, you know, who are the buyers. Okay, the national government who's the buyer needs to know that right now over here I need bricks. I don't need plumbing. Okay, but just because there is pressure to spend the money and the plumber is standing right over there and he says, come on, you can buy this plumbing from me. We say, okay, fine, let's just buy this plumbing. Eventually, maybe we'll get to use it. And so we put it aside over there. Okay, but that time never comes for us to use it. So it's, there is nothing, nothing illegal happening. It is all transparent. It is all above board. It is just the way it is put together. That is the problem. So if you, you mentioned that a lot of this loan, or that the aid is in loans, and so this one-year project where so much money needs to be spent is then like paid for by subsequent generations as the loan is being paid off. So would you recommend that um, aid be raised domestically and not um, like come from foreign donors in the form of loans? Uh, you know, there are, there are people, uh, for example, most of the developing countries have poor, very poor tax base. Again, I know Pakistan very well, and I can tell you, I was just looking at, at uh, their, uh, uh, somewhere, that, you know, 63% of the population of 180 million is non-tax paying. And in the last year, or the year before, I forget which year, but in one of the most recent years, there was only 1.2 million uh, people who file taxes. So it's 180 million. In the, in the business sector, and again I might be a little off on, on numbers, but the, there are about uh, 41,000, 40,800 or 900 businesses that are registered with the state bank or the, or the tax authorities of Pakistan as businesses. And out of those, this past year or year ago, only I think um, um, uh, 16,000 16, or 14,000 actually paid taxes. So yes, there is an issue of the of the government's treasury uh, not being not having the revenue to fund a lot of these these activities themselves. Uh, but you know, if it whether it is a, a, a quite a substantial amount of assistance that comes to developing countries is also in the form of just grants. For example, U.S. government just gives grants. This $1.5 billion a year that U.S. government is proposing to give to Pakistan is basically development assistance in the form of grants. So multilateral agencies, the, the World Bank and Asian Development Bank uh, give loans, and they give soft loans. And I, I'm not an economist, so I don't know the terms, but I know that they give loans at, uh, at uh, under conditions which are not very harsh and not very difficult. They're called soft loans and they have small uh, long period which the country can use to return and you know all of those things. So it's not that that is the difficult part. Mm -hmm. That is not the difficult 
part of how the money is generated and how how it comes. You know, Pakistan is an interesting country that almost you know three fourths, two thirds of the of the parliament doesn't pay taxes. So you're right that uh, you know the money part is not not the not the difficult part. So we have a little reception, so you can continue to talk at the reception. But let me take just this one last question from Amjad okay. Saab, and then we'll. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when I was growing up in Pakistan, there was no tax withholding. About forty years ago, there is now uh, income tax withholding um, by most corporate employers and um, even some. Nonprofits. Um, I just wanted to mention that. Sure. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, public-private partnerships, and could that be a, a component of the model of the ideal model in uh, donor-funded programs? Sure. You know, anything can work. It depends upon how it is made. To work, how it is made. So clearly, yes, private entities have uh, a lot to offer. You know, if you look at uh, even in in United States, if you look at some of the and since I work uh, uh, for Department of Health, I know that we also use a lot of private providers and private uh, vendors to supply goods and services. So that's not to say that that model cannot work, but the model can only work if it is applied within the context. And the context again is that if the if the regul if uh, if the regulations are there, which can be uh, can uh, the, if the if the regulatory structure is such that it facilitates the functioning of the private uh, partners, if the monitoring structure is such that it holds the private partners ac accountable, if the if there is uh, uh, um, processes and and uh, and procedures in place that can br bring about the flexibility to change things midstream, to bring about corrective actions if you find things are not working. Uh, most of the time that doesn't happen. So, which is why if you look even at the pu public-private partnership models in, in most of the developing countries, they haven't really worked that well. And I don't think that it is because of the private pa partners who weren't good or, you know, I think it's because of the context. No, I mean a, a, a clear-cut investment by by the private partner. There should, you know, be, I, there yeah. should be a, a risk of loss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. You know, I I feel, and this is just me, I feel that in, in social sector uh, service, in social services, mm -hmm. the responsibility rests with the state. Of course. Okay, so you see private entities, for example, in Pakistan, there is the Eidi Foundation. You know, Mr. Uh, Satar Eidi provides ambulance services. You find uh, the um, Sindh Institute of Urological Technology, you know, which is again a private. But, you know, how many, how many, how many Adib Rizvis would you have? How many Satar Eidis do you have? One of the very senior Pakistani bureaucrats got very upset with me at another function where we were talking about this. And he said, well, you know, you can't be blaming Pakistan all the time. You are saying nothing happened. Look at uh, Satar Eidi. I think he's just wonderful. And I said that any time he, and he said, you know, there's a five minutes in, after an accident on the streets of Karachi and Satar Eidi ambulance turns up and, and takes. I said, fine. But suppose there is an accident on the streets of Washington, D.C. Do the citizens expect a, a Satar Eidi to come from somewhere and, and pick them up? No. It is the responsibility of the state. So which is why I feel that, you know, it, it would, it would, it is, it is, it is much more effective and also a bigger bang for the buck if the state takes that responsibility and is held accountable and then partners with private entities. And, and you know, the business of service delivery can be contracted out. But it has to happen in a in a in a framework of monitoring and regulation and accountability. That again also rests with the state. So thank you so much for your really important, difficult words. Um,